I'm one of those people like I have to see the value of what I'm doing and I'm not saying consulting doesn't do that at all I think I struggled to see that for myself I no longer subscribe to the idea that where you work is your family they're not your family I was working like day and night you know what I was working day and night ended up with a vitamin d deficiency because at that time I didn't see sunlight my grandfather passed away all in that time and the only time I took off was after the submission of the proposal. I'd found out that that proposal that I'd been working on, even though like I'd slogged so hard, we didn't end up winning it. And I ended up becoming the scapegoat. You do give so much of your time and your life to these jobs. If you end up realizing that there's no like human component to it, then you kind of do feel like, well, what was the point? <laughs> That's great. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are yeah, you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. So, like, when I was going through your LinkedIn, yeah, mm -hmm. as I do, as I'm doing my research, yeah, yeah, um, you've had a array of like different roles, and like most of them being around like consultant. Um, I guess my first question that I want to open up with mm -hmm. is like, what type of consultant are you, or did you do, and have you always been in that realm of like advising people in terms of what they should do better? Yeah, I mean, so I feel like everything goes back date uh, goes back to like my upbringing culture so I went the total traditional route so being South Asian it was always like be an accountant like do your accountancy stuff and whatever um so I've worked in tax forever so yeah always always basically done um a form of advising clients yeah absolutely but in in specifically in tax corporate tax mm, how'd you end up in tax then oh, do you know what like you know one of those times when you think like if I could go back what would you do like 15 years ago I mean I graduated in 2010 so right around Financial the time of the recession yeah, yeah exactly and the truth is there were so many people I knew who were applying for jobs and they weren't getting any jobs so I applied for an internship and um I did very much get totally like pulled in by the glamour of like corporate and all that sort of stuff with books <laughs> um I applied for one internship I got that and then in the internship like they obviously show you the I mean like you know they show you the best part of it right so I did have a great time in the internship and I got offered the job so I took it and uh, I mean like rightly wrongly I don't know yeah probably maybe a little bit me wrongly like I didn't do I didn't try out anything else I didn't and that's probably why like I am where I am today yeah wow. I mean you say that so despondently <laughs> no I know I know do you know what it's, it's true like and I often think about this because I think I think without sounding like I'm um like humble bragging but it's one of those situations where like I've always been like really motivated so whatever I'm doing I'm always going to do a good job which is probably how I've gotten senior doing something that like I wouldn't say you know I wake up every morning thinking like yeah I live and breathe this um but that's probably a good thing because one thing I do think is that if I could figure out what it is that really makes me wake up in the morning and think this is what I'm going to do, imagine how much I could fly doing that. Mm. So where do you think that comes from? That kind of like, regardless of what it is, I want to give it the best of my all because not everybody has that same mentality, especially if it's something that they find boring or they don't necessarily like. Where does that come from, do you think? Um, I mean, honestly, for me, I feel like immigrant culture. Mm. Like you're always taught that no matter what you do, work hard, invest the time, do your best kind of thing. My dad always would say that, like, whatever you're doing, just make sure you do it with passion. Um, literally, like, grew up hearing that statement constantly. Um, so that, I think that probably is, but, and I think that is a good thing. And I would love to, for example, like, teach my son that. But at the same time, I would also want to, like, teach him the other side of the coin, which is like, but also figure out what you're passionate about. Um, don't just, like, do what you think you should do. Like what, what society thinks you should do kind of thing. But it's, it's such a challenge in one, right? Because um, I have this conversation a lot around, like if you had parents who mm. first generation immigrants, they came down and then they're working like super hard so that they instill that kind of hard working mentality into you. And then you work super hard and you kind of like raise the profile of wealth or the finances for your whole family as a whole. And then you have children. Yeah. And so the burden of pressure or the burden of hustle is even less upon them upon your children and so it's like how do you instill that kind of element of still working hard but enjoy yourself yeah um, but I don't know if you can can you have both like especially when you're young because you might not necessarily appreciate one versus the other one without the other no and I, and I think so everything you just said I think that's a really good point and I think it's a really 
I think probably you're in a similar situation to me, right? Where you're kind of like, I want to figure out how to get financial freedom, like peace of mind or whatever. So my kids don't have to worry maybe in the same kind of way. Precisely, yeah. Um, I, do you know what? Actually, funny enough, I was listening to a podcast recently and one of the things that this woman was saying was, um, you know, these days is very much a culture of like, find what you're passionate about and just do that mm. no matter what. And although I would say, yeah, I took the traditional route, et cetera, et cetera. I do think there is a merit to the fact that like today I'm trying to figure out what I'm passionate about, but I'm doing it on my own terms, with my own money, with my own everything. Whereas I feel like there is a bit more, there is a bit more culture in the next generation, which is that, you know, from like 21, I've got no money to my name. I'm going to still figure out what I want to do. And if all else fails, fails, I've got that parachute. Whereas for me, I feel like because I don't have that parachute, no matter what, I'm going to make it. I'm going to figure it out. And I think that's the bit to instill, which is like for your kids that, you know, I'm not saying necessarily you need to hustle in the same way, but just remember that don't lean on a parachute. You should want to, I'm no, it's not that I'm not going to be there for you, but you should want to be able to do it on your own two feet. You should want to, at the end of your days, both say, do you know what? It was my grit and my tenacity that got me there, not because I thought mummy's there to pick the pieces up if mm. I need to. Yeah, I like that, I like that. Yeah. And then talking of tenacity and grit, so you're saying now that you're at the point where you're starting to think about your passions, like what you really want to do, but back in the earlier days of when you were starting your career within tax, like what was the vision? Was it a case of like going to the top, like become CEO, or was it like getting a skill and then maybe pivoting to someone else? Like what was your thinking at the time? Um, so both, I would say. So I mean, yeah, hundred percent. It always used to be like when I was a uh, when I was a new joiner. Like one of the things everyone used to talk about was like, "Are you going to go to partner? Are you going to make it to partner? Are you going to make it to partner?" Which is obviously where all the big money is. And that was always the thing in my head. Like one day I'm going to be a partner. Um, I did think that I would move out of tax and probably go into like the more core consulting stuff, which I actually, so partway through my career, I did pivot into consulting. Uh, it wasn't for me though, in the end. Um, but yeah, the, the thing always was make it to partner. And it's ironic because I'm one level away from it now. And I'm at the point where I'm like, do you know what? I'm actually at that crossroads. I either go and I'm all in and it truth is partnership is a lifestyle choice. Um, I mean, just like being a CEO and everything is right. of like a massive company. It's a lifestyle choice. So I would have to buy into it. My whole family would have to buy into it. And no matter what, like, you know, holidays won't be holidays in the same way. Or I think, is there something else out there for me? Mm. Before we go on to that, talk to me a little bit more about the pivot into consultancy then that you decided it went for you. Yeah, I mean, do you know what? If I think back to it, I think um, one thing is that everyone always everyone always used to say to me, and this is probably like the power of words, right? Everyone used to always say, like, I don't come across as the type of person who work in ta works in tax. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, oh, I would have always thought that you were in, con in consulting. And mm. I think that always got into my head. And also consulting is just so much more glamorous than tax. Mm. Like, come on, you know, they travel all the time and like clients are just a bit more sexy and whatever. But I think that at its core, like I... I'm one of those people, like, I have to see the value of what I'm doing. Like, I have to feel it. I have to actually see. And I'm not saying consulting doesn't do that at all. I just, I think I struggled to see that for myself. Um, and so, like, after a year, I decided to move back into tax. But I actually, like, the the you know, if I take away from that experience, like, I don't have any regrets at all because I took a risk did something totally different, tried it out, et cetera. But it was the skills that it taught me because straight after that, I basically asked, can I move to Singapore? I oh, see. Yeah, so I was like, I want to move back into tax. Cool, but can I do it in Singapore? But I had that confidence to be like, you know, I'll go and I'll figure it out. And so there's so many people who don't have that confidence to do that. And I'm, I'm going to build my network from scratch. I'm going to figure out the landscape from scratch, like geography, everything. I'm going to do all of it. So I did it as well it was like straight after that I did it for two years okay there's so many points but before so okay so going into consultancy in the first place like was that at the same firm yes was it a difficult transition to make because sometimes when people are in like back office going to front office they can face a lot of like rejection did you face that or was it easy enough for you because of your like reputation 
Yeah, I mean, do you know what? I'm going to make it sound like, because I also feel like I'm thinking about when we spoke before as well, that I'm going to make it sound like my career was like easy peasy. It wasn't hard, honestly, to do the transition. Um, actually, moving into the role wasn't difficult at all. I'd like built a network, plus you know people, all that kind of stuff. And I think, you know, that, that kind of um, interest to talk to people, I've always had it. So I'd already, I'd already had like a bit of a network within consulting. So that wasn't a problem. But actually doing the role, that I did find challenging, mm -hmm. to what be about honest. What about? Yeah, again, just, you know, I suppose like figuring out the value. F I think like consulting, they're a whole different, like the people in consulting, they're a whole different type. Their mindset's very different. Um, without getting super kind of like deep and technical into it, I think when you work in tax, there's very much like an answer to what you're doing um in consulting you often have to you have to you know where you need to get to but you kind of need to figure out what the problem is and you have to define that problem and help your client define it and it's like it's just like a different way of navigating things and I think probably by the time that I moved into consulting maybe like my brain was just working and it like had been sort of trained in a certain way that kind of stuff plus um for me like I had done a professional qualification and I was finding that I wasn't using that in my, um, in consulting. And at the time, funny enough, like I never thought that I would miss using it. Really? But I actually did. Mm. Like I always used to think like once I did my chartered accountancy, I was like, you know, what am I going to do with this kind of thing? Um, and did I waste time doing it? But then, yeah, that, that year in consulting made me realize like, actually, no, do you know what? I actually want to do something and with it and it's funny because now everything's sort of come full circle where I'm like full-on using it in my day-to-day -day. um and even like in my day-to-day -day, but also even in my personal life with all the obviously brown woman wealth stuff I'm like talking taxes and things like that all the time so it's, it's funny nice. how life works out honestly you know, especially actually. when you make something which is so like technically difficult in a much more easier language for people to understand and that probably is why people couldn't believe you were in tax because um in my career when i started off in finance i used to get the same thing yeah where people said to me oh i can't believe you're in finance like, yeah, yeah, you're, yeah you're not in sales or something like that at the time i was like what, what, what are you trying to say yeah. like <laughs> do i not look smart no, enough or 100%, is it the, is it 100%, the answer, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. and um and then i but then i started to flip it in his head that rather than it's being i don't belong it's more about like i have a certain quality or trait that makes the complicated stuff less complex and easier to communicate to people and so then it becomes like a competitive advantage to you yeah. compared to all the other finance people you know yeah yeah um so during your like journey whilst you were at consultancy like what was it that gave you the confidence to say i want to go to singapore even what inspired you to say that country of all places as well um so i i so i'd actually been visiting singapore like from childhood so that was actually mm -hmm. one of the reasons and um my parents like being Indian and stuff, I always had this in my head that like it would be great to kind of do some time in Asia at some point. Um, so that's kind of the reason Singapore, to be honest. But then, you know what? I think after, after, um, and I do think Singapore, like for my career, from a technical standpoint, my two years in Singapore, it was actually like a defining two years of my career, actually. Um, I think I just thought, you know what? I've got nothing to lose. Like at the time when I was talking to, she was a director, I was talking to her about returning back to my old team and I could see there was very much like, yeah, yeah, we'd love to have you back. Like we've really missed you being here. And I was like, you know what, let me just push on that a little bit. And what would a white guy do, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and um, see like well, how far I can kind of push this a bit. And then, yeah, it just sort of, I just said, you know, w is it possible? And it just so happened that she'd also spent time in Asia and she'd, you know, a similar thing where she was, she's partway through her career. She was like, you know, I, I want to do this. And, and so I guess she saw a little bit of that in me and then she helped make it happen. But again, you know, just going to your point about the fact that people used to say to you and the competitive edge that you had from being that, people person I think the fact that you also make people feel comfortable right that's I think in, in the world of finance and like tax and stuff that's not something that necessarily everybody has um being able to sell to make money that's one thing and then being able to make people feel comfortable so that they want to work with you that's a whole different you know and I think that makes people want to help you that was the reason why I was saying that oh that's a good yeah. I like to look at it that way mm. so when you're in Singapore is it still like your first firm yeah yeah it? yeah so I was with them for like 
10 years. Okay. Yeah. So still, so whilst you're in Singapore, it's a great opportunity that you're actually able to do that. So how was that for you, like meeting new friends or did you have like people already there? Like how did you get yourself up and running? Um, so uh, I did know some people, not loads. I did know some people. I, I would say that, yeah, I mean, like, so Singapore in itself is an amazing, amazing place to live and, you know, like, have an experience outside of your home and all that, like, home country and things like that. Um, it helps that it's small, so it's less overwhelming, I would say. Um, it also helps that there's a huge, obviously, expat immigrant culture. So everybody wants to make friends with new people. Everyone's away from family. Everyone's, like, you know... There's so many people from the UK, US, Australia, those like all over the place that come to stay and live. And it's very transient as well. So people know they're only there, like most likely for a couple of years before then they move on to stuff. Um, so, I mean, making friends and things, you make friends with everybody, but you only stay friends with a few people. Um, and I would also say like the, the firm itself, because of the expat nature of people coming in, they also were quite supportive with like helping, you know, me meet other people, introducing me to people, that kind of thing. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I, w I actually think about it a lot. And I think, you know, one day, would I like to move back? Would I like to um, spend more time out there? Because I feel like two years now that I think about it, like it wasn't well maybe enough. enough. Yeah. yeah. I mean, most people say they're going to move somewhere for two years and it becomes longer, but you actually stuck to two years and came yeah, back. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what? I was in a shitty relationship. Okay. So I, the coming back to the UK gave me actually the strength to leave that crappy relationship. So oh, because long distance, or was it whilst? No, it was whilst I was there. I yeah, see, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, it, I think because I was out there uh, and no family, no support, no like people, um, I didn't have the courage at the time to be completely honest to leave the relationship. But when I came back to the UK, I think everything just, you know as in like life throws the stuff at you right when it's read the time for it to happen and coming back to the UK at that time um yeah I finally got the guts to just be like this isn't serving me so we need to walk away yeah yeah so actually everything works out yeah. in the end that's perfectly awesome. yeah that's amazing so that actually makes me think because if I count so the consultancy that's one year then the time in Singapore that's two years so that's three years and so Sometimes when people think about making like a step out or a step abroad or something like that, it can feel that you're taking a step backwards in your career because you're not like putting enough years underneath your belt because you're going somewhere else. And if you're coming back to square one, yeah, yeah. then it's like, was it worth it? So did you feel that you kind of, obviously it was great experience, but did you feel that you're coming back to kind of square one and that you probably could have done without? Like, how were you thinking about your progression at that point? Do you know what? absolutely not okay. and you know to that point about things that have shaped your career and stuff like that so I'm honestly a firm firm believer on in it's all about how you spin the story um I a, a piece of advice that someone gave to me in my like early years was that like when people are really junior everyone gets really hung up on titles right and that's something that always stayed with me so yeah you know what like maybe for a year I think when I moved out to Singapore, I'd asked to move at like a higher level and they were like, no, we're going to bring you at the same level you currently are because you need to do X, Y, Z. Um, at the time, yeah, I was a bit irritated and things, but I still did it. And that was like, when I look back at it, that was the best decision Interesting. ever. Because the truth is, I, that's what I say, like those two years from a, like a technical career standpoint, I kind of went into it, pulled my sleeves up just got straight stuck in like mm. I've probably I would say like in my whole career um there's probably only a handful of other times where I can say that you know my knowledge base that I grew during that time because of the fact that like and, and it like a as a result of a series of things happening um the fact that I was at a more junior level the fact that their team wasn't that big the fact that it was not as like evolved maybe as mm. the west or whatever but it just gave me a chance to understand what I do through and through so like to the point that in the end you know that one year back I ended up getting fast track promoted like in six months while, when I returned from Singapore to the UK wow yeah and and like and even now like I'm a director I'm the youngest director in my team mm. and that too like by 10 years so wow. in the end, that's what I mean. Like, I genuinely believe it's all about how you spin the story. Mm. Um, if people get hung up on like, oh, you know, oh, the grade I wanted or whatever, like the pay wasn't there. Think about the long term thing, especially if it's a career we're talking about, not just a job. Um, 
think about what you can create the competitive advantage the unique experience that you're creating for yourself like it might just be two years where you're doing at more junior level or whatever but when you for example I came back no one had the experience of Asia Pacific that was something I was able to sell like I had a whole network in an entire continent that no one none of my peers had it was impossible to compete with that right um so I absolutely spun the story to my advantage yeah and especially because like AP is such a it's left field. Most people want to go to like New York. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So it's actually interesting that you were still able to get the exposure whilst going to AP in the first place, right? Exactly. Yeah. So how were you like? So you got the promoted after a year or so. Um, were you feeling like what were you going through emotionally? Because sometimes when we're getting promoted quite fast um, and things are going well, like we're on a high. But some people might feel like there's a hole inside. Like what was going on for you? So it's so funny when you're asking this question. Like, like, I remember at that time, like having conversations with my parents and my dad, like saying to me at the time that, you know, don't don't be too um, like fiery about wanting to get promoted fast, because sometimes you need to make sure you get the experience, etc. before you do it. And, uh, do you know, it's taken me a really long time to think this way. But I think I, I really do now think this way, that there is someone incredibly um less skilled than me doing a job that's paying them twice as much as I'm earning because of this voice mm. that sometimes goes in my head about like you know oh my am, am I like experienced enough am I this enough am I that enough and sometimes you just need to be like do you know what I'll learn it as I go because I'm backing myself um so I think yeah there's probably like a bit of apprehension and there's a bit of lots of stuff right whenever you start something new but I think being able to kind of say to yourself that it's not going to be that different to what I'm currently doing um and the fact that people much more experienced than you the fact that people who have been doing this a lot longer than you are backing you and believe you can do it means there must be something in it so I think yeah that's probably like without sounding super arrogant which I believe me I'm not um I think mask like fake it till you make it a little bit. I right? think it's confidence. Yeah, isn't it? yeah, exactly. like confidence in your ability, and then like even confidence in your ability to figure it out. Because um, I see it sometimes, even like one of my friends where he got promoted like so fast, like he was um, like a VP probably at like maybe like twenty eight, mm. and the average age is like ten years older. Yeah, yeah. And um, I think for me, what I saw was that he had a lot of senior leaders who kind of believed in his ability. He had that kind of sponsorship where you have that relationship where he never looked at titles, but he had a relationship with his people. So they were willing to kind of back him and know that if he's in a, a pickle, he'll basically figure it out. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes with promotions, even the people who are the most overqualified, because they haven't got back in, they'll become overlooked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's one of the... I like this is one thing that again I feel like in my career it's taken me time to understand Mm. um but so much of it is about marketing yourself so much of it like arguably more than actually being good at your job Mm. like I've seen so many people in like 15 years now I've seen so many people who um like I've been in a position for example where like I've joined an engagement or joined a project and people are telling me oh x whose role you're taking over god you know really big shoes to fill they've been doing an amazing job blah 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 and I pick up the pieces and literally I'm picking up the pieces because what they've been telling the people up there is completely different to the show down below Mm. and you know (sighs) The thing is, who's having the last laugh? Because quite often these people, they're actually making it all the way to the top. Yeah, yeah. So mm. I, I don't know which... Th- I think the whole point around integrity, I'm not sure. I am I feel like the jury's still out with me in terms of how much it actually matters to other people in corporates. Like, how much does it matter to me? That's one thing. But how much does it matter to other people? How much what? How much integrity? In, like, integrity does somebody have where they're mm. telling the truth about how well they're doing and how much they're marketing... How mu- How like how much they're inflating the marketing about what they're doing. Because what does marketing yourself mean internally? Yeah, just, I mean, like, for example, going up to someone senior and being like, oh, I'm involved in X, Y, Z, and, you know, um, the revenues I'm generating from this is this much, and there's a potential for this, this, this. Like, Mm. they're never going to come and challenge all those numbers. Really? Right. I mean, only if you're in a situation where, like, for example, um, a business case is being interrogated for a promotion. But on the whole... 
the truth is like on the whole i th- this is my experience from professional services like the majority of reputation is held on word of mouth it's true it's, it's not true. like you know people aren't coming and checking with the client is she saying that what she's saying is actually true and and that's why it's so it's so easy to inflate your reputation if you just speak to the right people and tell them the things they want to hear versus if you want to if you want to get there by always doing the right thing unfortunately i think those are the guys that end up like coming last that is such a good point because um even when i think about it like i used to hate like the whole marketing yourself because i felt that if you do a good job it should just happen like cream should rise to the top but evidently it it doesn't um i remember one time in (laughs) i don't forget this time when so you know you have your year end ratings yeah 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 i've said this before but it's like i'm doing my year end i thought i smashed it got my results back it was so bad i was thinking what's happening here and it was just because I didn't explain myself fully in terms of the projects that I was doing. So then what I did for the next like six months to a year, every week I sent an email to like my director saying what me and my team had done like mm. every week, following up, following up, following up. So they gave that extra visibility in terms of what we were doing. And then they had like kind of, what's the word? Thread of evidence. Yeah, to yeah, prove yeah. That we absolutely. Had, that um, audit trail. Audit trail, that's yeah, the yeah. word. And that felt authentic to me. And that felt like anything that's there, you can proof check it because I'm also saying that this is what we've done this week, this is what we're doing next week. And then the following week, I can say, here's the things that we said we're going to do, this is what we did, and then keep that going up. Um, But sometimes you do see people who are, like, you don't know how they're able to just, like, navigate by the gift of the gab or just... I don't know, just talking nonsense. Uh, do you know what no. that what you what you've just described? That's exactly the same thing as happened to me before. So, and I and I remember I must have been like in my early twenties at the time, and like I was quite junior, and I remember my um, appraiser, like counselor or whatever. So she she actually was amazing, and yeah. she was one of those people who she genuinely wanted the hard workers, like the cream to rise to the top. She really did. Um, and I remember in our meeting, she would always say to me, like, well, aren't you doing this? And aren't you doing that? Because she was speaking to other people, which I didn't realise. And most counsellors don't do that, mm. right? Take the time to go and speak to people you're working for, etc. So she was basically building, like, my promotion case for me, even though that wasn't the way it was supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And I still remember, like, once we had, like, our ratings and stuff all come out, she she said to me that, you know, you are probably operating at one of the top of your year but because I had to tease out so, many informa- so much information from you, yeah. like I wasn't able to rate you as high as the other people mm. who I rated as high. Um, and she was like, you need to think about how you present. And that's probably why to this day, like I'm probably not as good as I should be, but to this, like now today, I think it is about how you spin the story. Mm. And the whole thing about, you know, I, th- I think maybe it is, I don't know, like a cultural point as well, where you think like it's okay to be a quiet achiever, right? Just get the job done. Um, and I don't know if it, I don't know if you have the same thing as we like, especially amongst South Asians, it is all about like humility and, you know, don't come across too like crass in front of people. Don't like shout too much about what you're doing and all that sort of stuff. But the truth is that's actually what you need to do in corporates in order for people to recognize. And arguably it does make sense, but I think it doesn't feel authentic, right? Mm-hmm. I like what you just said, though, about the audit trial point. I've never thought about doing that. You can have that one. Yeah, for yeah. I think I might take <laughs> it. So how did you find your voice then? How did you start, like, sharing your kind of accomplishments more easily in a more authentic way for yourself then? I, if I'm being brutally honest with myself, I would probably say that I am not where I should be with this particular, like, improvement. Um... I think I still have a way to go. I think that there has been a change since I became a mum where I'm kind of like the word bold is basically what I think is very much like shaping my personality after returning to work after mater- after maternity leave. Um, I think that I've been fortunate that I can build relationships with good people. And I've always had in my head that um, in a corporate, you need to have at least one person in the room behind closed doors who's like, I'm not going to leave until this person gets what they need. And I've always had that person or tried to have, I've always had that person. Um, And if you have that, then you're probably okay. And that's probably what I've leaned on. But I now kind of can see that, I think especially when we talk about 
hustling you have to talk so much more about what you're doing and why is it amazing and why is it impactful and why should other people know about it but I think the fact that it is it's got more purpose behind it I'm finding it so much easier to do that like the fact that you know I reached out to you I feel like a few years ago I never would have done that I would have in my head straight away the imposter syndrome would have kicked in and I would have been like he's going to be like what the hell who are you <laughs> like you've just literally started out but because I genuinely believe in what I'm doing I was like, you know what, maybe that passion will come across in my message to you kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, I think that's probably where it's changed. It's more changed because of the place I am in my life as opposed to the, the where I'm doing it. Mm. No, I think, I think maybe it's like a combination of experiences and like reps of, okay, you might not have done something like this, say, five years ago, but you did something five years ago, which has led to this place today, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and I want to pick up on what you said about, like, people who are in the room kind of vouching for you. How do you get those people to sponsor you? Is it, like, old leaders who you worked with, you worked with, or, like, is it more intentional relationship building? Like, what do you tell some people in your team now in terms of how to navigate that? Okay, so I'm going to be totally, like, brutally honest, Please. right? And um, if, if, I'm, if I'm, for example, like, talking to, I don't know, like, a junior member of my team and I'm saying to them all these things, because I've been burnt by this. So it's about identifying who are the people who have influence and who have power. Mm -hmm. It's as cutthroat as that. You may get on with someone super duper duper well. And I'm not saying don't do work for them, don't do whatever with them, but just recognize that if they don't have influence and power, it's very limited what they can honestly do for you later on. So you need to identify who are the people who've got influence, power, who are willing to use their voice in that room. And, you know, like even when the gavel's been beaten, they're like, no, you need to hear what I am saying. Mm. And that's how genuinely like I personally feel like I this is what I say to everybody give them all the evidence I'm not saying like you know get them to say stuff about you that's not true give them all the evidence but they have to be willing to shout the loudest in that room to make sure they come away or they make sure that you're getting the result that you want that is honestly like that's how everyone does it in a corporate and if you're not doing it that way or you're kind of using too much emotion to be like oh but I really like this person and therefore I want to do 75% of my portfolio with them it's not going to work like that unfortunately that and that's actually my own personal experience like when I first joined my last firm so I was like two years in or whatever uh I worked for a group of people who I loved I really really liked all of them uh one person ended up getting get, being made redundant one person left after um, like after becoming a mum, but she was so quiet and timid that in when it came to like the promotion meetings, like she would never speak out loud. So people would be saying whatever, and she wouldn't she wouldn't challenge. And then you just realise that actually it's great having friends and stuff, but that's the thing if you apply too much emotion to your profession. I don't know if I sound really cynical, but in just my experience, I'm like, there's just no point. At the end of the day, you've got to get somewhere, right? You need to earn that money. That's why you're there. Um, if you if you don't recognize these are the ways to kind of like get ahead, you're just never going to get there. Yeah, I totally agree. And it kind of reminded me of like how in some situations, like I have some friends and I've heard from other people where they're kind of promised promotions or they're being promised the next move. But to your point, the person who's making the promises how much leverage, how much power, how much say do they actually have in those rooms? Oh, yeah. Because they could just be getting shouted down, even though everyone knows that you should be the next person to be promoted, but it's just because of someone else has got a louder voice, their recommendation gets highlighted first. Exactly. And, mm. and you know, again, a piece of advice someone gave me some years ago, which has always stayed with me, don't ever, ever accept a promise that can't be given to you right now. Mm. That's like, I think people don't, tell you that or teach you that right like if someone senior is saying to you like oh you know what we'll put you through the promotion process in the next year you you take their word for it right because you do you you don't have a reason not to no i need to be in the promotion process right now but have you seen that happen before yeah really yeah yeah the person who gave me this advice yeah so the few things he said he said to me actually which has always stayed with me is there's always a pot of money no matter what they say there's always a pot of money there's always a space for a promotion, no matter what. There's always a process or like an exception to the process that can be made. You just have to be the person they want to do all those things for. And unfortunately, I think too many people 
they don't realize that if those things aren't being offered to you they may not be offered to you here but they'll be offered to you somewhere else if you do the time and do the effort etc that's required of it mm. so don't feel you need to stick it out because oh these things aren't there these things don't exist they do exist mm. talking of sticking it out and making a decision to twist right mm. so you were at your first firm for 10 years and this is where you were a grad like everything they kind of like i don't, yeah. I don't, I don't say groomed but that's not the right word but like they raised, they, they yeah. raised you right yeah so a lot of the times there's like this sense of responsibility where or loyalty because they put so much into you you end up staying with them for a longer time maybe even longer than you should have before moving so what for you was like the straw that broke the camel's back and where you decided to leave and um should you have done it a bit earlier would you say yes to the last question mm -hmm. definitely um i often think about this actually and i think that i should have left three years earlier than I did, which is basically as soon as I came back from Singapore. Okay. Not because anything like bad, like I, again, I think my experience at the first firm was amazing. And yeah. I genuinely think that I would not be where I am today in terms of grade, in terms of like mindset, in terms of lots of things, because I, you know, I no longer subscribe to the idea that where you work is your family, they're not your family, mm -hmm. right? But I used to very much think in my head that, um, Oh yeah, what I said. That's why I said they raised me. Because and I remember even in my leaving speech, I was like, I feel like I grew up here. Like, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> um, I the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, so I was on a proposal. Oh my god, I was working like day and night. You know what? I was working day and night. Ended up with a vitamin D deficiency because at that time I didn't see sunlight. Wow. Yeah, and. My grandfather passed away all in that time. And the only time I took off was after the submission of the proposal. Um, after he'd already passed away, after all the hospital stuff was done, etc. Like I took time off when his funeral, I think I took like two days off for, for his funeral like the day after. And then other than that, I was like juggling everything, supporting my mum, supporting my grandmother and everything. And um, I was really, really close to my grandfather, like really close to my grandfather. So it, it really hit me hard. And I think for the first time in my life, I probably suffered from some level of depression at that point. Um, and I remember, so two things happened in the office. I remember going in and I was speaking to someone who I thought was, um, or I considered her like a mentor, a coach, like lots of things. And I remember saying, like going into a meeting with me, like a, a catch up with her and I was just like I'm really really struggling and she asked me like what are you struggling with but it was the way she asked me the question even though she knew the whole like I'd been there for such a long time like everybody knew that my parents lived overseas my grandparents basically were like had been taking care of me for such a long time everyone knew that and to the point where there was another partner who I remember she said to me she emailed me after my grandfather passed away and she said like look I know that you were like particularly close to your grandfather so you can take some extra bereavement days like the firm's willing like we as a partnership are willing to offer you that so it was a known thing mm -hmm. so anyway it was the way she asked me this question like what have you i can't say it in the same way but i remember it was the way she said it to me and i remember answering the question and i was like well what was the question she asked me like what are you struggling with mm -hmm. and um and i remember it like thinking I literally just emailed you a week ago to tell you my grandfather had died and yeah and so I and I said I was like well there's obviously a lot of work going on and my grandfather's died and you know just sort of saying it in such a weird way and then she was like well you know kind of basically just like move on sort wow. of thing um and then af after that basically there was a, a I'd found out that that proposal that I'd been working on, even though like I'd slugged so hard, we didn't end up winning it. And I ended up becoming the scapegoat. And it, and it kind of got pinned on me that the reason it wasn't won was because I wasn't like, my head wasn't in it fully. Um, and I was like, do you know what? What's the point? Like you, you, you do give so much of your time and your life to these jobs and I know that I'm getting paid and I'm not doing it as a favor or anything but you really really do and then if it's all if you end up realizing that there's no like human component to it 
then you kind of do feel like, well, what was the point of doing all of that? I should have, I remember at the time, like someone was saying to me that when they found out that their grandmother wasn't well or their grandmother, I think she'd passed away, they literally like pens down immediately. But even after my grandfather passed away, and the thing is he passed away in my arms. So it was at that, you know, like it wasn't like, oh, it happened. I found out a day later or anything like that at all. Um, I still went back to work. He passed away on the Friday night, Monday, I was still back in the office. Um, and that's what I mean, like, you know, when you don't get that in return, that, and I think it's probably like, you know, this is probably a deeper thing than as opposed to like, oh, you know, I was fed up on my job. But I really thought that I was going to stick it out the whole way there, like intern to partner. I really thought I would. Mm. And then when you just kind of think, you know what, this isn't, this isn't the right people for me. This isn't the right place for me. And and that's okay. You know, maybe it, it was the universe's way of telling me it's time to make a change or whatever, but yeah. it was yeah, a pretty big, and that's when I say it took a pretty big thing to happen to me for me to actually change, uh, actually change my job. Um, and that's why I say, like, if I honestly reflect, it probably happened three years too late because I three years before it would have happened for one of those surface level reasons. Like I got more, offered more money, got offered whatever, but it took like something to happen for me to actually almost break the family tie. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that with me. Yeah, no yeah that's a lot. I mean, it makes sense though, because I think if it's a surface level reason then there's a chance that after that event and you move on you could always look back with like rose tinted glasses like oh maybe i should have stayed maybe this that, and the other but going through that kind of experience and that basically you showing you the extreme level of what could happen when things maybe that accelerated what you could have learned 10 years later on another 10 years later um everything happens for a reason and yeah. i think it's crazy how that one person's reaction kind of shaped everything you know yeah yeah and 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 i think like that person probably doesn't necessarily realize like how much of an influence they had both in a positive mm. but also unfortunately in a negative way like some things they've said to me along the way that have stayed with me even to this point like you know having conversations about um wanting to see more diversity at leadership levels and literally it being turned around and said oh but i don't see color <laughs> and you're like oh, do you know what is there any point in having continuing this conversation like yeah. stuff like that or like you know having conversations and talking about like where inappropriate things are being said mm. and it being turned around but like well what were you doing in that situation that maybe led to those inappropriate comments being said and you're like wow mm. you know and it's only after the fact that you think like those things shouldn't have been said those things shouldn't have been thought that person should have been educated a bit more and that's what i mean like you know I think there's a lot of responsibility when you get to senior levels in these roles when people don't necessarily realise how much the words weigh on people. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And um, talking of words and weighing and like moving up to senior levels, like one thing which I always look at is how different life is if you're a male employee versus a female employee. Mm. In a sense that for men, it's kind of, for lack of a word, it's simple. Like, we ain't got to do much, like, family <laughs> planning. <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, that's, that's what it is, right? Whereas yeah. I feel for women, there's a lot more, I don't want to say pressure, but there's a lot more, there, there needs to be more of a strategy in place in terms of when you decide to take maternity leave, right? Because if we like it or not, in some cases, that acts as a type of penalty yeah. in terms of, like, slowing down your growth, slowing down... Um, where you want to be, even like moving companies, because if you are tired of where you are, but you want to have a child, because of minimum tenure, you have to stay there, you have to slug it out Absolutely. and come back again, you Absolutely. know? So whilst you're like navigating in 10 years, moving firms, this, that, and the other, like obviously you're a new mother now, but like was that kind of playing in your mind in terms of when you were making the right decision to move and like the timing of when to have a baby as well? Do you know... This is actually one topic that I absolutely love because mm. now looking back at the whole thing, I actually, it's one thing I'm so proud of myself for like how I've managed it. Um, and there probably was that I like, I will say there was an element of intentionality with it, but not as much as how it's ended up playing out. Interesting. Um, so when I was again, like first, second year, I remember there was a woman who, um, she got married and she fell pregnant straight after she got promoted to senior manager. And I think I was like overheard a conversation. So it was literally like chance of this conversation being said to me. Otherwise I probably wouldn't have been aware of it. Um, someone saying, oh, she's, she's planned it perfectly where 
she's now become a senior manager, so she's going to get the senior manager pay when she goes on maternity leave. And I never knew anything about this. And the truth is, I don't think it really gets talked about mm. enough, to be honest, for young women who one day are obviously planning to have families, planning to like figure out, but you need money. <laughs> Kids are expensive, <laughs> right? Um, but that always was in my head. And I remember someone saying that, okay, well, if she gets, um, gets a senior man, if you get to senior manager and you then basically have like full pay for X amount of time and then you go into half pay. So depending on whatever your company policy is, but ours was like, my policy was that, um, your half pay still is the equivalent of like a first year salary. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it's an amazing, amazing money. But obviously you have to put in the time to get to that yeah. point. And that, the difference between like, for example, getting pregnant and being a manager and also the fact that you then most likely I mean, obviously now it's changing a little bit, but then you most likely have to spend some more years at that grade for mm. some time versus if you do it when you're a senior manager is huge. Mm. And I feel like senior manager is a good place to get to as well, to then be able to be like, okay, now, you know, life, my personal life is going to take priority for a bit. Um, so I very, very intentionally planned it so that I would get married but have a baby, most importantly, after I made senior manager. It just mm. so happened that I was a director at that point as well. So even better, even better to be honest. But yeah, um, I did it very, like, in that way. That that was a plan that was always there. But then in the year before getting pregnant, I made a point of, like, saving up a little nest egg for maternity. Uh, so, like, during my maternity leave. So if, for example, my maternity pay, maternity pay didn't cover all the things I wanted to do... Mm. I had this little nest egg ready for me to use it. Um, and that's, I guess, where, like, my personal finance knowledge all kind of came into play. Interesting. So would you say, like, because that's very, like, intentional, as you said, in terms of how to do it. Are those conversations, they don't happen enough, would you say? No, I personally, I, I don't think so. Like I say, like, genuinely, this conversation, it started off with me overhearing something mm. and then me going to people and saying, like, oh, you know, is this the case? I think probably there are... Um, there are forums. I'm not, you know what? I'm not going to say that there aren't forums that exist where you can probably tap into this conversation. But the truth is, I think most, or like a lot of young women, at least like my, for myself, right? Mm. When you're in your 20s and you're still far away from getting married and stuff, like you don't know what are the questions you need to ask unless you know the questions. Yeah. And things about like maternity and how does it all work and how much time do you have to spend at a company prior to being eligible and um, what's the impact on your career later on? Like what you just said, the motherhood penalty, that's a serious, serious thing. Mm -hmm. And if you don't plan in advance, the mother motherhood penalty is like a huge component of the wage gap between men and women. And it can so severely impact a woman's like, the value of their retirement, the value they have at their retirement, if they don't think about it in advance. Mm. And the only way to honestly get around some of these things is to plan and intentionally invest so that you can kind of combat that and also then be able to take control of your own life rather than a company telling you, you need to come back at this time because you need to earn a salary. Mm -hmm. You can then turn around and say to yourself, no, I'm going to come back at this point when it suits me and my child the best. Yeah, yeah. So what do you think about men then that take up paternity? Because especially oh, wow. with some firms who are like extending out their like leave options for some for some men where before it's like two weeks statutory in some places it can be like up to six months. Um, they still would face that kind of penalty, right? Oh no, but it'll be fully paid, so maybe not. Um okay, so it works differently for paternity and actually mm. and in actual fact, unfortunately, because of like what statistically it shows is that men who um, become fathers they actually are positively impacted in their careers uh, by becoming a parent. Because, if, for example, if they're juggling a child plus the career, etc., cetera, um, society kind of perceives it as, oh, my God, wow, he's doing so amazingly well. So that means, you know, there's that, like, positive sentiment in their head. That's the bias that ends up being created. Mm -hmm. But having said that, I personally, um, you know, I come from a situation where I don't have a village around me. Um, so the fact that my husband's company gave him four months paternity was honestly the biggest lifesaver in the world. Like I wouldn't change it for anything. Yeah. 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 No, I love that. I love that. So, and then for women, right. So what kind of questions should they be asking? What do you think? Or yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you, first of all, need to find out like, you know, 
the things okay in my situation if i could go back because i still think there were some mistakes i made um you should find out what your policy is Mm -hmm. you don't sit down and talk to your like friends at work speak to hr speak to hr get on a call and be like hi can we please can i speak to somebody who's knowledgeable about the maternity policy um they will first of all turn around and say to you okay well here's the policy read it read it and then say i've got questions now (laughs) um take that time seriously to do that you your kid your partner whatever will all thank you um you need to think about have conversations with your partner about the situation you want to be in when it comes to maternity do you like from the time you want to take off what do you want to be doing during your maternity do you want to uh like pay for your child to go to nursery during that time because all of these have costs um i think when people fall pregnant they only think about they often think about only um you know like oh I need to buy the car I need to buy the clothes but there's obviously all of these things to think about as well like how are you going to live if Mm. you want to take a certain amount of time off so for example for me I ended up taking 13 months off in total but I didn't go a single month without pay even though I was off because I managed to like orientate myself so that I had annual leave that I could cash in on I had xyz just so like I was really strategic about it Mm -hmm. um and actually that nest egg that i was talking about that i i put in place as an emergency maternity fund i didn't end up touching it amazing so i'm actually redirecting that into buying property so i'm just keep kind of expanding my personal finance and like my portfolio and stuff so my retirement now becomes easier Mm. um and then just in terms of like other questions i was just thinking that you know think about the amount of time you want to take off think about whether or not you want to go back to your career or not think about what going back to your career looks like, how you're planning on juggling that um, and the costs all involved with that. Is it nursery? Is it a nanny? Is it, you know, uh, and the fact that like what, what level you're comfortable being at, like, so basically what pay are you comfortable being at to be able to afford the lifestyle that you want for you, your child now, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Talking about those questions because um, that year it's like, <laughs> I remember I have this conversation with my wife where um, it's that realisation that it's not actually a year off work. It's still work, yeah, <laughs> just yeah, a different yeah. time. Yeah. Um, but it also gives you a little bit of time to kind of reflect and say what you want to do for yourself and what kind of like impact you want to give like outside of your child. But you can also feel a bit self, not selfish, but you can feel bad as well yeah. if you're not putting all of your time on the child. Um, I'd love to learn a bit more about like your experience since considering you just came off your 13 yeah, months yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do you know what, funny, when I was coming today, I was like looking at my son at home and I was feeling so guilty because <laughs> I was like, oh shit, I'm leaving you. Um, do you know, I was actually just thinking about this when I was sitting outside and I was like, shit, you know what? I feel like motherhood for me was yeah like a massive whiplash for all the reasons like you know you know no one can prepare you for becoming a parent you Mm. can you can do all the classes and do all the blah blah still the steepest learning curve of your entire life but I also feel like whiplash because I spent my whole 20s fixated on like I said like partnership fixated on just getting up the corporate ladder and suddenly this little person comes along and challenges without realizing they're challenging your whole purpose like, what are you doing? Why are you doing it for? What, like, and what's the end goal? What's the objective? What do you, in your final days, want to look in the mirror and be able to say about yourself? Um, and th- and I, I, didn't, I didn't actually see it as selfish because I think I looked at it like, I'm doing all of this because I actually finally have my purpose, which I don't think I've had. And without sounding really cheesy, like I was meant to be a mother, like, I'm not, I'm not at all saying that. You know, I love being a mum. But I also feel like for the first time, I have a responsibility to somebody to show them that this is what going after your dreams looks like. Mm. And if I don't do it, who's going to show him? So talking of dreams, like how did you get clarity on knowing what your dreams are? Um, so I feel like probably I'm on the journey of figuring that out right but I'm taking the steps which is the first time ever in my life that I've give almost like given myself permission to do that actually so after my son was born I'd probably say that um I think like again really uh I don't know really like stereotypically or like really I don't know in a traditional way like I would be literally like doom scrolling constantly on Instagram and you'd constantly see these like people who are into like digital marketing and they were like you know make a million billion pounds in a day and all this sort of (laughs) stuff you just need to do one two three um and but the thing is like some of the stuff they say actually does make a bit of sense like 
figure out first of all like a side hustle right and often it's a case of figuring out what is something that you're already doing and that was what I guess got me into personal finance because the truth is I was always one of those people that was talking about like oh get this credit card because it's like the bonus on the points over here and I'm selling loads of crap on Vinted and you know all that just extra extra kind of trying to do those little small bits I do wish that like I had more of an entrepreneurial spirit from like a younger age Mm. even more than this but this is what I had been doing for a long time like and I'd been trying to figure out for myself for example with taxes personally Mm. how could I be more um efficient and effective with my taxes and you know just basically trying to increase I was more looking at it from a increase my savings perspective rather than an increase my income perspective Mm. um and I'd already started like so after my son was born I'd already started dabbling into investing um as a passive way of generating income and thinking about it in terms of okay you want to get to like a certain pot of money and then you can coast to your retirement and then after retirement you'll take a small chunk out of it and basically the whole like fire model right but I think after my son came it was like a fire lit in me to be like okay you want to get there a bit faster Mm. and that's probably how the whole like personal finance world really opened up for me because I started researching into it for myself because I didn't want to be doing this until I'm 65 yeah. right um the whole concept this like seed was in my head which is like you can only save as much as you earn but you can earn an infinite amount that was there mm-hmm. or has now is very much in my head um and I kind of figured you know what there must be other people like me and there must be other people who, whether it's because of a kid or whether it's just because you just don't want to be doing this until you're 65, whatever, but you just don't necessarily have the information or it's not in a, it's all like in a finance bro kind of way. And as a result, they just don't, they're too scared to do it. So mm. I thought, you know what, I'm going to try and make it bite size and more easily understandable. And also like raise awareness amongst like my community and people who look like me who don't necessarily have those conversations at home or someone to kind of take them under their wing to say like, hey, have you thought about your personal finances? Have you thought about your retirement? Have you thought about how you're going to fund X, Y, Z? And my like, you know, the whole brown woman wealth and the personal finance component, that's very much what it's about. It's trying to just basically make personal finance accessible, uh, easily digestible and also like, create a forum for people to ask questions and not worry about it being stupid because Mm. as i say i've worked in finance for 15 years but i only started getting into this in the last five years yeah i I think um it's even commendable as well because when you can take all the information for yourself but also willing to share it i think that's the key thing like even for myself like i had a finance blog like back in 2015 it's called one pound something and um i got into it same way as you like i'm in credit cards I know what the best credit cards are my friends ask me what the best credit cards are yeah get these credit cards and yeah. it's just that kind of personal personal recommendation um so for you what were like your first steps of like going into the world of like financial freedom so you talked about investing and I love what you said about saving versus earning because for most people they think about saving more when really the game is earning more so I love for you to like just orientate me a little bit about that um so I mean when you say um like talk through it how so like as in so as in your journey of mm. like how you started setting up your own like personal finances so you talked about investing so yeah yeah, yeah. where did you start investing Got you it. talked about making extra money was that through investment or was that through like different types of hustles and things like yeah that? okay so okay so two things right so yeah uh, the first one in terms of how did i get into investing so i think it's something that I've had in my head for a really long time. Actually, my grandfather was like a massive investing. Like he was a trader. He retired as a pilot from being a pilot when he was like 50 and he ended up living until he was 86. And all those years, he, they like used to, him, like his little group, they used to talk about his like Midas touch because mm-hmm. he was just so good at day trading. Um, so this kind of like thing had always been there in my home and people used to talk about it. Just never talked to me about it. Um so I always thought initially that when it comes to investing, 
it was more the whole trading, like think Wolf of Wall Street type yeah. situation on the phone and doing all that sort of stuff. And I can't honestly pinpoint like where did I find this the information, but it was probably just because of like what you were consuming and your phones are constantly listening to everything you're doing, right? Mm. Um, something came up about index funds and the fact that it gives you more exposure and it's less stress and it's, um, yeah, so less stress, more exposure, more chance of getting a better return. It's also obviously less risk in comparison to investing Way in one less, company, right? Less sexy, right? Yeah. yeah um, and so that's how... I'm a massive advocate of index funds. So that's what I personally invest in. I am invested, for example, into individual companies and God, mm. it's so stressful that I don't think it's worth it. I'm waiting for things to like take <laughs> a change yeah. and then I'm going to like cash in and get rid of those positions. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, other question regarding side hustle. So I would say again, like after my son came, um, okay, you know what I was saying about like selling on Vinted and stuff mm -hmm. and selling on Facebook Marketplace, all this kind of like small things, they do all count. Mm -hmm. And I never appreciated that they all count. I always just thought like, I just have this like habit of like, I'll buy something and then if I'm done with it, someone else may want it. I don't want to just chuck it away and this without realizing it's kind of sustainability stuff. Yeah. Um, but that's a side hustle. Mm. And again, just like after my son came, I probably just started so much more. So um, started selling and doing all those kind of bits a lot more, but then also, I think once you start realizing that there is a there are so many ways to earn additional income, anything and everything can become a side hustle. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, like even through kind of social media and trying to create a page, et cetera, to be able to think about, okay, how can you monetize this? So it's not just about in relation to personal finance and like doing collabs and things like that. It's also about, for example, if I'm going on holiday, is there a way to do a collaboration with like a hotel or something? That's all thinking about how do I avoid me spending so that I can invest that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I, I suppose it's a mindset change that now has happened where mm. I'm kind of going down that route. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that. And um, I'm going to press you a little bit more on the index funds. So what, yeah, index, yeah. what index funds would you say? Or uh, what platform as well? Oh, yeah, okay. So I'm Vanguard mm -hmm. through and through. Uh, my son's also Vanguard. Vanguard's quite expensive, no, in terms of fees. No, so if you, for example, S&P 500, mm. I think it's like 0.28% or like, le no, sorry, it might be like 0.08%. Don't quote me on that. Oh, really? Okay. Um, it's it's low, though. Okay. I've yeah, been Because yeah. I've been a nutmeg aficionado like since 2012 or something like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I mean, I'll so... Vanguard out. So Vanguard, I joined because again, like a lot of a lot of people who'd achieved financial freedom and were talking about it on social media, use for example Vanguard Fidelity. Um, and when I went on to Fidelity, or when I went on to Vanguard, let me put it this way, I found it super user friendly. Mm. Uh, just like the whole setting up of it, everything, being able to pick the funds, etc. I just found it all great. Okay. Fair. Um, and even like the user interface, mm. you know, because at the end of the day, I, I think that that's one thing like people are so afraid of investing because they're scared about not understanding exactly where yeah. their money go is going and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so I personally am a big Vanguard. Okay, I'm gonna add, I need to open up one for my daughter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. do yeah. it, do yeah. it, do it, absolutely. Um, okay, cool. So now that you're entering back into the world of work um, and then still on that trail of like making it to partner, you were saying like your son has made you reconsider things. So is it a case of like taking things a bit more slower on that road or just keeping your eyes out in terms of what's around you as you're still working towards your purpose and living in it? Um yeah, I think that's a good question. I probably am very much like literally as we speak, reflecting on all of this, right? And actually today, even like I had a call and I was speaking to a partner and he was talking to me about, you know, think about your partner case, think about your partner case. Um, I do feel like, I, I think I've talked about like mindset shifts so much during this session, um, but it is the biggest thing that's happened to me, honestly. And I know, again, it's really cliche because everybody changes when they become a parent, right? Mm. But I just, I don't know, like... It, everything has changed for me and more probably than I've even let on to like friends and family and stuff. But um, I'm, I think that for me now, it's kind of like whatever I do, I have to find the passion in there and I have to find the purpose and it can't just be about making other people rich. Mm. Um, 
that probably was and, and like again no regrets for what I've been doing in my 20s because it's enabled me to do what I'm doing today um but I think as I said like at the beginning partnership is a lifestyle choice everybody has in fact like when you go for the like to, for example like to uh do your business case and all that sort of stuff where you talk to like a panel of partners um, I've heard that one of the questions that gets asked is like, you know, how does your family feel about you going for a partner? Because mm. that's, it impacts everybody's life. Yeah. Um, and I think that you have to really want it. If you're, you have to really want it. You have to really love what you're, you're selling to be at that level. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm just not sure that's for me. I mean, this is how I feel right now. But who knows? Yeah. Who knows? But then, you know what, today I was thinking about it and I was like, at the end of the day, at some point in life, I feel like if you really want to like test your limits and you really want to um, figure out who you are and what you're capable of, you have to take a decision to be like, fuck it, I'm back myself. Mm. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you, Sanskrit. This has been amazing. Um, so before we close, I've got a couple quick fire questions for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. So first question, um, what's like a book, film, or even like documentary that you always like to recommend to people. Can I say, why? can I say a podcast? Oh, go for it. But don't be offended if I don't say this one. Oh, it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> but Diary of a CEO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know it's like any particular episode. Would you say? Oh, I honestly don't have a particular episode, mm. but I think you know what? Last year. Um, I picked up running again and uh, I started listening to the podcast and I don't know how I hadn't come across it before. You only found out about it last yeah, year? Yeah, only oh, last wow. year. I know, exactly. That's probably, that's the reason actually <laughs> I'm saying it. But genuinely, I found it transformative. Yeah, transform amazing. Like to the point where I was telling my whole family, telling my husband, telling friends, I was like, oh my God, you have to, you have to listen to it. You have to listen to it. Um, took a flight on Emirates, listened to it on Emirates. Mm, it's a solid podcast. <laughs> yeah, though. like, yeah. and do you know, I think if, it's not an episode specifically, mm. but I, my parents are entrepreneurs. I grew up with that my whole life uh, and probably had up until the last year, a huge amount of resentment towards my parents about the time they took away from me um you know I mentioned because my grandparents like helped take care of me and stuff because my parents were abroad so they were abroad working on their mm. business um Stephen Bartlett gave me a whole different perspective on my parents mm. and literally like I can't remember which episode it is and I think he mentioned it a few times but he talks about like what it's like for a, an entrepreneur what it's like in that whole space and the fact that it consumes you and the type of person that you need to be in a relationship with or married to whatever in order to be able to um, understand all that. And, you know, like, I think the relationship you have with your parents is probably, like, if not the most, one of the most important relationships you have in your whole life. Yeah. But those couple of episodes I listened to, it's literally transformed my relationship with my parents. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. So if you haven't listened to it, which I think I'm probably the oh, last no, person in the world. No, yeah. not you, but <laughs> oh, like <yeah>. your listeners. <laughs> yeah. um, if they haven't listened to it, I'm probably the last person in the world to have listened to it. So I doubt it, but <laughs> listen to it. I think it's amazing. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, what is a, if you had to leave the world with one message, what would it be? Fuck it, just do it anyway. <laughs> Um, what is a piece of advice that you hear people give all the time, but you actually think it's bad advice? I don't know, it's maybe a bit con controversial, but like, do you know the whole thing about like follow your passion mm -hmm. no matter what? I don't think that's great advice. Okay, got it, got it. And um, can this I one, can I put a bit of context around that? Please before, do. Before yeah, yeah, go for it, go for it, go for it, go for it, go for it. I think that. You have to have practicality a bit in life. What does that mean? Like, set yourself up so that you, when you get to a point where you are following your passions, you have, th you know, that point I was saying at the beginning, you have that backing. Mm. That it's not a case of like, you know, for example, you have your first attempt and if it fails, it's like, shit, I've got nothing now. And it, that, that beating is that much harder. Whereas if you've got something underneath you protecting you, not a person, I mean yourself, you've built it, you probably have a few more chances to keep going and hopefully something sticks. I agree, actually. Yeah. Because um, even that example, because if you go straight out of uni and start a business 
and then you come back into the world of work a bit later on. You haven't got much experience and you're coming back as an entry level. Whereas if you work for like say 10 years, decide to take a break, you come back straight at the same level and you're still on a good amount of money and you've got a nest egg and you probably have a property exactly. and you have all these networks and relationships. Exactly. So it definitely does give you like a hands up or legs up. Exactly. Yeah. And, and the truth is, the truth is, not everybody is mm-hmm. a Bill Gates, a Richard Branson. Like they, the reason we know their names is because they are one of a kind, mm-hmm. right? And I think too many people these days think like, oh, well, Richard Branson did it. He didn't go to university. Mm. Obviously, I can do it too. Like, no, mate. Yeah, it doesn't work. Like <laughs> That's this. not how it works. I agree. <laughs> um, and then the final one. So I'm trying to start new. Mm. So it's going to be what would your words of encouragement be for the next guest? And before I, uh, you give yours, so the previous guest wrote this for you this is really nice i love this question (laughs) (laughs) do you know i want it's so funny so a couple of weeks ago i read this thing which was like about manifestation and they were saying that you know sometimes just put the message into the universe and you will find even if you're not thinking about it, like consciously, an answer will come to you. Like yeah. one way or another, it will happen. There you go. Um, yeah. well, are you, you going to say it out loud? Oh, you can do. Yeah. Oh, okay. You so can say it out. You can say it. It's okay to quit something if you don't love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have to think about that one. <laughs> uh, um, what would be my words of encouragement? Um, okay, so my words of encouragement would probably be like in the same vein, which is whatever you're thinking about doing, just go for it and worry about the what ifs afterwards. Mm. Don't, don't waste time thinking about that. I, from experience, I'd say I wasted time. Don't, just don't do that. Just worry about the what ifs later. Okay, awesome. And then final, final, final question. Where can people find you? Oh, Brown Woman Wealth on Instagram at the moment. Um, yeah, so I'm obviously here to like talk about all, thing, all things personal finance mm-hmm. and like sorting out my portfolios in my 30s. So whether you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, whatever, if that's a bit of you, come find me. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. No, thank you so much. I really appreciate this. Thank you. Yeah.